God. Later. <laughs> okay, Lynn's having an issue with his computer. Sorry, um, Gerald, but I, 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 I'm, I think I'm here. If I think you're there. Stop yeah. doing crazy things. Uh, I think you're there, Leighton. Yeah, I'm here. Oh man. Oh, what a day. <laughs> <laughs> what what went wrong? <laughs> oh, uh nothing really went wrong. It was just the fact that last night an opportunity arose that I just couldn't let go. And who was she? Well, it was my loved one, my partner, who passed away two and a oh. half years ago. Oh. And it was just this weird set of coincidences that a friend of mine who's actually been on this podcast was, was out in Kauai and sent me pictures of a place that Pauline and I visited. And it just struck a chord because when we were last out there is when we actually met John and his daughter and she was battling cancer. Um, oh. And we went to this special place and she said, Leighton, if I do pass away, will you spread some of my ashes here? Oh. And I told her, absolutely, sweetie. Um, well, lo and behold, it's just not looking like it's going to be an option for me to get out there anytime in the near or future, if that. So a thought came to me about how I could do this. And so I reached out to her daughter who has the ashes and I asked her to have her husband take 11 sheets of organic paper as close as you can get. They actually found some cotton paper. Yeah. And I said, mist 11 sheets, sprinkle ashes on it and let it dry. And then tomorrow I want you to take 11 sheets untouched, sandwich those 11 sheets and then put another 11 sheets on top and FedEx it out to him in Kauai. And I'm going to have him make paper airplanes and launch them off this cliff where she wanted her ashes spread. Oh, yeah. And literally, dude, like I was texting. I mean, I had to go through FedEx to try to figure out how to give send him a, a FedEx label for overnight priority to Hawaii. Um, and my the, the FedEx uh, program was all locked up and it kept changing everything back after I did it. And literally, I've been chasing him to get that address and he sent it to me 10 minutes ago. And then I'm oh. trying to scramble through all that. I got it. I printed it. I shot it off to him because he needed it by 5, which is now 5.08 there. <laughs> but I did it. I got it off. So hallelujah. But that's the reason why I was late was that there was something really, really important that needed to happen. Yeah, uh, so, it sounds really, really important. And uh, I fully understand. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, my friend. I appreciate that. And my computer is still trying to send up pop-ups. Um, it's probably all my energy right now. Oh, well, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, welcome back, my friend. It has been over a year. And I'd love to hear an update of, of what you've been up to lately. Oh, okay. Uh, what I've been up to lately. Uh, well, um, do, do you think that, that your listeners are aware of um, what we found earlier? Uh, because it's kind of difficult, it, uh, difficult to describe what we're doing now um, if, if, if it's not clear what we, we did earlier. So uh, please inform me. Yeah. Well, I think that the vast majority of this audience does know, but maybe you're right. Maybe you should reel back and recap a little bit about what it is Easy Water is. And, and we'll also uh, have Ken pull up the um, fifth phase of water so that people can actually you know, bounce over to that if they uh, so desire. Well, okay. So... Um, um, let let me start by by saying that um, our work stands on the shoulders of giants, and um, uh, w what we found about a fourth phase of water uh, is not completely original. Uh, we 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 found something, um, but it started with a guy named Gilbert Ling, who passed recently at about at age 
approximately a hundred years old. I think he was just shy or he just made it through. I, I, I can't recall. And his idea, his idea was that in biology, uh, the water, the water inside the cell was not like um, um, the stuff that I, I have here. Um, it's not a liquid. It's actually, uh, uh, it's actually a, a, an a form of water in which the molecules were ordered. In other words, see, in, in a glass of water like this, the molecules are bouncing around at a fierce number of times per second, and they're randomly oriented. But this kind of water is different. And his idea was that the water molecules were basically stacking on one another. Um, and, uh, and, and he had a lot of evidence uh, for this, uh, or at least evidence that the water inside the cell and, and perhaps beyond um, was of this ordered uh, variety. So we took off from there and we quickly were able experimentally to confirm uh, th that in, in, indeed this, this, there, there exists a kind of ordered water. Um, we, we found it by starting with a premise based on Gilbert Ling's work on the premise that if molecules are lined up, it's like a crystal. Um, because in crystals, molecules are lined up. And if you have a pure crystal, then if you think about it, uh, if you started with, um, let's say it's a water-based crystal, if you started with a uh, with water, if the water had contaminants, those contaminants would have to be cast out before the crystal could form. Because if you have a pure crystal, it obviously has, it's pure, it has no contaminants. So we were looking for something that excluded. And we set up, we set up a system uh, in, in which uh, we took water and some particles, we put particles in the water. Um, those particles were little spheres called microspheres. And then we plunked a, a gel into the water, a small um, uh, piece of gel. And we observed and we found uh, very quickly that next to the surface, next to each surface of the gel, uh, the microspheres were pushed away progressively. And it took a matter of maybe 10 minutes or so. And by 10 minutes, you had a zone next to each face of the gel where those microspheres were excluded. Um, so that's why that's when we call it the exclusion zone, um, because they exclude it. It's easy, is it, it easy to remember? It works well in the U.S., but it, it doesn't work so well in Europe because it's EZ instead of EZ. Anyway, we called it EZ. But later, when we found that the properties of of the water in this zone uh, differed um, substantially from the uh, similarly measured properties of water, we realized this is something different. And um, we, we then came to the conclusion that this was behaving like a different phase of water, a phase in which the molecules were, were ordered, just as Gilbert Ling has suggested. Uh, but this was actually, this was outside, outside the cell. This was um, in so-called in, in vitro. And, uh, and soon we found that, unfortunately, that Gilbert Ling's ideas um, were not exactly on target. Um, and we, we found this when we, we inserted electrodes. Um, and I had a lot of experience with electrodes. First of all, uh, my training, or originally my education is electrical engineering. So I knew something about electrodes. And after that, uh, we used electrodes that and invented by the same Gilbert Ling, by the way, um, uh, that that came to a very fine tip. So you could stick the electrode into a cell and measure the potential inside the cell, and pull out the electrode, and and the the cell didn't die of a um, uh, of, of a um, uh, a knife wound, so to speak. The cell behaved fine, and so. Having had that experience, um, we decided to make some electrical measurements just for fun. And we found something that was a shock, uh, not literally, but um, it was a shock. We found that the exclusion zone had negative charge. And um, we, we, uh, we began, <laughs> it was so interesting because, you know, you start with water and water is neutral. And you find a zone, a great big zone, uh, as by molecular standards, a zone at first that we measured to be about um, two tenths of a millimeter, and and later we we found zones that extend uh, commonly up up to a millimeter, and in certain um, circumstances up up to a meter even. Uh, 
uh, under under certain uh, special circumstances, and we found it was negatively charged. So again, you start with neutral water, and you find a big region with negative charge. You know, and it it it, it doesn't take any genius to figure out that if you started with neutral water and you find a region with negative charge, you got to find a region with positive charge. The two have to add up to zero neutrality, and we found it. Uh, we so so the exclusion zone, uh, which existed right next to the surface of the gel, uh, if you go further out in, in, uh, beyond the exclusion zone into the water, you find positive charge, um, and um, and these positive charges are uh, mostly free. Uh, though, uh, as is well known, they bind to water molecules. You've got protons from the water, the positive charge of the water binding to other water molecules is giving you a so-called hydronium ion. And this is well known in chemistry. This is nothing, nothing original. But anyway, the main point is you have a negatively charged exclusion zone or negatively charged fourth phase sitting next to a positively charged uh, region. And that's a battery, negative and positive. And we could confirm by sticking one electrode in the negative and one electrode in the positive that we had, we could get current out of it enough to light an LED lamp. Uh, so that's the proof of principle. But there's one subtle thing that um, I, I, I need to bring up um, because I think it, it, it relates to a similar issue in, in photosynthesis. Uh, I'll come back to photosynthesis if you remind me, which is I know relevant to, to your interests. Um, it, and, and that is, uh, that is, it, you know, if you have a negative region next to a positive region, it's like a man next to a woman. You know, they they want to uh, they want to combine, right? And uh, um, and so positive and negative, and you know, you learn in fundamental basic physics that that plus and minus uh, they don't want to be apart from one another. They want to recombine, give to give you neutrality. So if you think about what I just told you about separation of a negatively charged EZ and a positively charged region beyond, it shouldn't exist. The, the positive should join immediately with the negative. And remind me, I'm going to go back to photosynthesis. Um, it, it should. And, and so there's got to be a reason why those two are kept apart. And, and we could find the reason finally in the structure of the EZ. And the structure of the EZ is very dense. So those positive hydronium ions uh, have difficulty entering that lattice. They really want to enter the lattice, but they can't do it. And the structure that we finally were able to to deduce is a, a series of the easy a series of sheets piled on one another. So the first sheet is nucleated by the gel surface. So you you get a sheet, and the, and the sheet can, is a, a honeycomb sheet. It's got hexagons, and those hexagons are really small. Um, next sheet is nucleated by the first sheet, it grows, and then the next sheet, and the next sheet, and they keep building up to actually hundreds of thousands of sheets. Um, it, it could be that large, not always that large, but it could be. And, and it turns out that these sheets are uh, shifted uh, by half the size of a hexagon from one another. So it means in, in the first sheet, if this positive charge um, this hydronium ion wants to enter the negative lattice, it has to go through those uh, those holes. But because the next sheet, uh, the subsequent sheet, is shifted by half of the dimension of one hexagon, it's like you have a, you have a hole with a bar right in the middle, and it makes the opening even smaller. So those hydronium ions carrying the positive charge, they have a hell of a time uh, getting in. Uh, and that they're, therefore they're they're kept outside, and so the battery remains charged. The plus and minus remain essentially indefinitely apart from one another. This is critical. It's a critical piece of information because when you have plus and minus, you have an energy source, and so wherever you have easy water, you have energy. Um, and just getting now, if if I may di divert for a moment to photosynthesis uh, uh, idea. Uh, so as you know, photosynthesis has, uh, I, I forget, about 20 steps or so. Most of them are not not clear, not really known very well. However, um, step one, when step one occurs, um, um, uh, light comes in, 
um, and, uh, and the light separates the positive charge from the negative charge. Um, and that's, that's well known. Uh, that's step one in photosynthesis. And it's a necessary condition for the following steps. The plus and the minus need to be separated from one another. As far as I can see, nobody except a, a colleague from uh, Brazil uh, brought this up to me. Nobody's ever faced the issue of, you know, why when you, when you separate, when light and the presence of chlorophyll uh, separates the negative from the positive, why don't they remain? Why do they remain that way? Why don't they just instantly recombine? Which, if they did, then photosynthesis wouldn't work. So, what what we found, what we found is is um, uh, a necessary condition is that you've got uh, the negative charge in a matrix of some sort that is so dense um, uh, as to not allow the positive charges to uh, to enter, and that's what keeps them apart. So what we found may actually be similar to the first step of photosynthesis. And just one last thing that I, I, I haven't mentioned is, is um, the energy uh, that builds the EZ, which we, we found uh, is light also. It's, it's infrared light, very similar to the first step in photosynthesis. And uh, um, so, so there's a kind of parallel between what we found, uh, the energy uh, coming from, from uh, light, separating plus and minus charge, very similar to what happens in photosynthesis. So it's possible that what we, we found is a kind of generic um, uh, way of gaining energy from light. Um, and and, uh, and photo, the first step of photosynthesis may, may be uh, one particular application of, of this essential principle an application uh, that, of course, nature, nature works, <laughs> optimizes whatever process it deals with. So probably it's uh, the most efficient or effective way of all the ways that we've been studying in the laboratory. Nature does it best. So uh, is that an adequate introduction to, um, um, or would you like to hear more? <laughs> no, uh, please expand on that because I think that's really important to tie um, the understanding of photosynthesis to this to this concept, because in the later conversation, we're going to talk about, you know, energy that is created through this and why it is so important for the human body. OK, well, you know, I, I said most of it, but just a couple of things uh, that, you know, photosynthesis occurs in in earnest uh, um, uh, when spring comes. When spring comes, it gets warmer. When it's warmer, there's a lot of infrared energy. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of people don't don't really uh, understand infrared energy too well. Most people know that, you know, when you have a toaster and you push down on the lever, the coils are growing a bright orange. And a lot of people say, oh, yeah, that's uh, infrared energy that's coming from the coils, the heat and such. And heat and infrared, it's not exactly the same, but but to a first approximation, you might say it, it, it's similar. So now if you take photosynthesis that, that occurs, it's springtime here in Seattle, and I, I can see um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the blossoms are, are out and some of the leaves are, are uh, uh, coming. And so photosynthesis is turned on, and it's turned on when it gets warmer. When it gets warmer, the environment is filled with infrared energy. Um, so uh, what I, I guess what I, I skipped over is, you know, we, we know that the infrared energy will come from glowing coils, but it also comes from just about everywhere. And the way, the way you can determine that is um, if you were in the room in which I'm sitting, which is my living room at home right now, um, and you turn off all the lights and, and put shades and windows, it's completely black. You can't see anything. Um, and not only can't you see anything, but but um, even even your trusty cell phone camera with exquisite sensitivity can't get an image. If instead you take an infrared camera, which is just like a regular camera, but the sensor is sensitive to infrared and not to visible light, you got a beautiful image, and you'd be able to see uh, uh, not only the the uh, the lamp that. Um, uh, that is is sitting over there, but uh, the banner that's behind me, and and the chair, and my nose, and and my beard, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, they would show up beautifully. That means, you know, if you can get an image uh, from all of this stuff, 
it means everything is generating infrared because that's what the sensor senses. So this is evidence that everything is generating infrared energy. And that's why the military uses it at night for night vision. You can easily see the enemy tanks, uh, even in pure darkness. So, so anyway, in the springtime, um, when the buds are out and, um, and uh, it, uh, things begin to flower, photosynthesis um, is, is occurring actively. And it's occurring actively because, because energy uh, from infrared is turning it on. Now, we know that photosynthesis is sensitive to um, a couple of different wavelengths at, the, at e either end of the, of the spectrum, but it seems it's also sensitive in a big way, which hasn't been uh, studied very much, to infrared energy. And that, that makes it similar to, um, to what I've been talking about because we found um, in, 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 in general that the visible wavelengths maybe contribute a little, but but infrared is is, is the is the the really the prime prime mover infrared light or infrared energy. Um, we found that it, it's actually almost a thousand times more powerful uh, than a, a few of the visible um, wavelengths. So so I think that that may have been missed by the photosynthesis people who um, were experiencing. Uh, experience mostly with, with visible wavelengths, um, and they've they've done outstanding studies to uh, um, delineate uh, uh, that kind of input energy. But there's another input energy that I think is working too, and that's infrared energy. It works in our experiments all the time, and I believe it works in the first step of photosynthesis too. So uh, my opinion is, um, and I'm usually wrong, <coughs> or often wrong, is that if you want to find out something about photosynthesis, please study what we've found uh, for fourth phase water, because um, I, I, I believe photosynthesis is a, a special case of the more general case of fourth phase water. And, and that's in my book called The Fourth Phase of Water, which turns out to be very popular. Okay, I think I, I, I should stop there and maybe entertain some questions that you may have. Oh, oh there okay. it is. Yeah, yeah there it is. it is. Nice. I didn't yeah. know if it was going to pop on or not. Um, and a lovely, lovely cover by my son, the artist, who's a professional sculptor, actually. Um, and one day he said, Dad, I want to illustrate, illustrate your books. And he's been doing exactly that uh, ever since. And if you open it, you'll see uh, beautiful diagrams and cartoons and et cetera. So it's, it's user-friendly. Beautiful. Um, yeah, that's awesome that your, that your son was able to help you in that way, a beautiful way. So, um, but anyway, back to um, a little bit more of an understanding on infrared, because in many ways, infrared is heat, right? It's, yes. it's so basically even inanimate, objects are to some degree generating some type of heat or yes. they wouldn't be able to be picked up right. and that goes back to energy and and so um one of the the most profound things that um i believe you also discovered um was the fact that the human heart um should not be able to do what it does and so in theory is it also friction that's that's heating the human body up uh, as a result of that uh, that friction that's occurring in between the vessels and the actual platelets? Uh, well, um, um, I think I, I hadn't thought about that, but but uh, it's it's possible because. For example, the red blood cells need to um, need to move through tiny capillaries, and uh, and the red cells turn out to be bigger, uh, larger diameter than the capillaries. So small capillaries would be like uh, three or four micrometers in diameter, uh, and the red blood cells that need to pass through are six or seven micrometers. You know, so it looks like um, it looks like nature screwed up somehow, and uh, um, it's a plumbing issue. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you know, so uh, uh, so it might it might be friction, but there's a, I think a, a more important point that that um, that leads back to how you opened this uh, segment of the conversation about that the human heart 
shouldn't be able to do all it does. Um, and uh, I, I guess let me just finish answering first your your, your question. I think metabolism is uh, is one way of uh, generating uh, infrared energy inside our body because it generates heat in the core of our body, and that heat gets uh, transferred to the environment, and therefore it goes through all the tissues, and the tissues receive infrared energy in that way. So we receive infrared energy from from metabolism, and we also receive it from outside because everything is generating infrared energy. Therefore, inside our body, and I'll, we'll get to that, inside our body, um, you, you, you've got a lot of easy water, and I'm convinced that it fills the cell. But, but, but going back to the human heart, so it's a story, and may I tell the story? Or oh, Please, I love this story, please. Well, yeah, you heard the story before. So. I know, but I, I love it. I want to hear it again. Yeah. Um, well, uh, um, the, the the first issue, which is not the story, but I, I learned this after the story, which is pretty interesting. My student found this. He, he checked literature um, and he found out um, that if you stop the heart, uh, the flow doesn't stop. You know, I, we all know that you stop the heart and, uh, you know, you're dead. You're, you, no, no blood flow anywhere to your brain or whatever, and you've passed on. Um, but it's not true. Uh, it was reported, my student found, in five or six independent publications in the last hundred years to which almost nobody paid attention. And that, that observation was you stop the heart uh, in whatever uh, preparation you're working and, the, the, and, and flow continues at a lower velocity, but it continues. Now, um, the, the obvious... <laughs> It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, you know, if the heart is not pumping, then something else must be pushing the blood through those vessels. If, if uh, So there's got to be something else. Nobody, as far as I could see, uh, nobody has paid attention to those, those papers. And by the way, uh, in, in experiments I'll tell you about, we reconfirmed it. We found blood keeps flowing in an experimental preparation, even when the heart stopped. So you need... You need to to have something beyond the heart. Heart can't do the the entire job. But what struck me and what really moved me it was a, a trip to Russia. So I went to visit my friend uh, Vladimir Vyakov, uh, who who is who runs the biochemistry department at Moscow University, w which is their top university in in all of Russia. Um, and uh, Vladimir. You know, after after some vodka and uh, and some other stuff, I, you know, um, um, uh, he he uh, he went to we went to his laboratory and he introduced me to his colleague down the hall, and he didn't speak English, so Vladimir had to translate. and And the guy approaches me and he looks at me and he says, "Do you know that in the cardiovascular system there's a big problem?" And and my reaction was, "Oh, <laughs> tell me." And I, I must admit, um, there was some skepticism. I had my nose up in the air, uh, uh, sort of, a, you might say, as the Israelis say, cutting the clouds with your nose, <laughs> um, because uh, my graduate work was done on the cardiovascular system, and I was involved in simulating the pressures and flows. And I thought, we had all the answers. Um, there was a, a touch of, of arrogance, on the other hand, uh, what this guy said had me convinced in five minutes that he was right and I was wrong. Uh, so what did he say? He said there's a big problem in the cardiovascular system. He said, you know, those red blood cells are too big to pass through the capillaries. And so what do you need to do? You, you need to squeeze those red blood cells to allow them to pass through. And indeed, if you look at, at videos of red blood cells passing through capillaries, you see that they're, they're not, the picture that you have red blood cells is like a donut that's filled in the middle. Um, but what you find as these red cells are passing through is that they're squeezed like this because somehow they have to get through. So he calculated, the Russians are big on calculations, calculated how much energy uh, would be involved in achieving that. And his calculations show that if the ventricle alone were responsible, that the ventricular pressure that you needed to develop to push those red blood cells, to squeeze them and push them, would be something like a million times um, 
a million times larger than even what you get with high blood pressure. Uh, so obviously, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work because um, you need something, some supplementary driver uh, to drive the red blood cells uh, uh, through the plants. And uh, so uh, he starts telling me about his theories, uh, uh, you know, maybe it involves some bubbles in the, in, in the blood and, I can't remember some of his other ideas. And meanwhile, instead of paying attention to all of his hypotheses, I was thinking, you know, we just found something in the laboratory that could answer the question and uh, or or solve the riddle. You need you need something that generates flow beyond the heart. And we we just found uh, in the past year or two before this fateful visit to Russia, we we just found that if we take a tube like a straw. Um, made of hydrophilic material as water loving material. So, you know, the, a, a tube and we plunk it in, into the water. Um, the, the water would flow through the tube continuously without stopping. And, you know, what's going on there it was uh, the first question that we had because this is so interesting. And, you know, usually if you have a, if you have a tube and you want to drive fluid through, you have to exert pressure on one end. Uh, and the pressure on that end uh, or pressure differential between the two ends is what drives the flow through. But here, there was no pressure differential at all. Uh, they were exactly the same pressure because the, the tube was immersed horizontally into the water. Um, and so for, for us, that was, that was really interesting. And we, we immediately could think of, uh, of many... Uh, uh, applications, including in plants, and we'll get to that. I think because I know you're you have real interest in that. But but um, uh, I was thinking that in the cardiovascular system, uh, maybe the same thing is happening. Maybe this this flow. We have a tube, and the tube hydrophilic tube is very similar uh, to the tubes in your cardiovascular system: uh, the arteries, the veins, the venules, arterioles, and especially capillaries. So if the same process were, were happening in the cardiovascular system, that process could represent the needed extra driver beyond the heart. So um, I asked my student, if uh, Jing Li, if he wanted to tackle that problem. And he did, and I'll tell you the result. Uh, but I got to tell you that he told me after he'd gotten a positive result, he said, when I first proposed that idea, that mechanism, he said, I thought you were on some kind of drug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because to anybody or everybody, it seems preposterous. Everybody knows that the heart drives the flow, and that's that's the way it is, um, you know, s since um, the, the cardiovascular system was discovered by William Harvey how many hundreds of years ago, and, and everybody knows and everybody learns that the heart drives, but the heart you know, if, if this Russian guy was right, and if those handful of publications I, I talked about over the past hundred years that showed that flow continues when the heart stops, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out there's got to be something else. So uh, Lee tested that something else. He tested the signature feature of the, of the mechanism we're talking about, which, which is that infrared drives it. Um, and um, the, the, the way it works is, is that you have a, a tube. I'm talking now about the experiments in our lab. You have a tube, and it's a hydrophilic tube. And just inside the tube is a ring of easy water. And that easy water sticks to the surface of the tube. And in the middle, at the core of the tube, you have the protons. Remember, you got negative, positive. So the protons, and the protons are free in the water. And they repel each other. When you get when you get enough protons repelling each other, they want to get away from each other as quickly as possible. And so, in the tube, they'll exit either this end or uh, this end. And that that's basically what what we found um, in in the laboratory. And so, Lee tested this in a chick embryo. So, a chick embryo, three days old. Um, you know, if the egg is fertilized, you can just lop off the top of the egg and you can see the circulation. In three days, it's pretty well developed, but it hasn't yet acquired the uh, neurological regulatory system and the hormonal regulatory system. So it's a pretty pure uh, 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 preparation. And, and 
And we know if this laboratory mechanism applies in the cardiovascular system, uh, it's run by infrared energy. So he put together this preparation, lopped off the top of the egg, uh, had a, 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 a system, microscopic system, where he could look at some of the vessels uh, uh, that exist that have already been developed after, after three days. And the first thing he does, he stops the heart, but the flow continues. Uh, lower velocity, but the flow continues. So that corroborated what was said in the literature. And then what he did was apply infrared uh, energy. And it turned out it turned out that the flow increased by more than three times um, when he applied m modest amounts of infrared energy. And so, so the result is that th this result is compatible with the idea um, uh, that the same mechanism that we found in the laboratory where we we took a hydrophilic tube and we immersed it in water and flow went through. Same thing is happening in your cardiovascular system and maybe even mine. Uh, that that um, it's run by this, um, in part, by this second mechanism um, that's based on easy water. And, uh, and we, we discussed earlier that easy water contains energy um, as a kind of generic uh, uh, feature. So so the, the bottom line is that in your cardiovascular system, Leighton, and maybe even mine, um, it's it's run not just by the heart, but it's also run uh, by this vessel driving mechanism. Um, so, you know, if if your heart stops or my heart stops, we still have the vessels that are pumping. Uh, how long that can persist and keep us, um, um, well, I wouldn't say alive exactly, but um, in some sort of... Um, uh, subliminal state. Um, I'm not sure, but it does it does go on. So, you know, we we're we're run. Um, we think we think that we're run by the by by our heart, um, uh, or our cardiovascular system is run by our heart. But it's run by a combination of the heart and the vessels. Both are contributing to the pumping of blood. And I wish we I wish I could say uh, you know one is five percent, the other is ninety five percent, or vice versa, but uh, we we uh, encountered technical limitations that were not uh, that precluded us from getting a quantitative indication. So so we don't know whether the vessel mechanism constitutes uh, um, five percent or ninety five percent of the energy. That remains to be seen, and we'll we'll do that in the future, assuming we can get some funding. It's it's not easy to get funding if you're doing something that's that's revolutionary. Uh, I think you you understand that, and oh, it's, all about it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you know, because you apply for money, and your your reviewers are often your opponents. <laughs> um, if you're if you're doing revolutionary work, you know you're you're challenging the status quo, and you're reviewed by the people. Who are defenders of the status quo? So uh, um, it doesn't it doesn't usually work. So right now we we have a um, limited um, uh, uh, limited number of personnel in our in our lab, and and of course we're we're looking for more because there are so many so many interesting experiments that um, need to be done. We're prepared to do them. Anyway, I hope that answers your your question. I maybe went on too long, but. Um, but there we are. So. No, that was, that was perfect. That was perfect. And it, and it feeds right into um, the next uh, question or idea uh, of trying to understand how water moves through plants so easily and abundantly. And I'm wondering if the same exact situation, because the plant, when it's a living, is very hydrophilic. And... Well, I, I, the answer, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, for example, um, in the xylem, you know, you think about the xylem, think about a, a 300 foot redwood tree. Um, and um, the xylem effectively is a tube that runs, <laughs> runs up 300 feet. Now, if you were to fill it, if you were to take a tube uh, of some sort, an artificial tube, and fill it, fill it with water all the way up to the top and measure the pressure at the bottom, it would be staggeringly high. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, we know that the water runs uphill instead of downhill, runs uphill from the roots all the way up to the crown of, 
of the tree. Um, and so the question is, how is this possible? Because you're 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 ex exerting force against a tremendous pressure. I mean, think about it, 300 feet high. Uh, and so, and 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 so the mechanism that that we discovered, where it's just basically infrared energy um, that creates the EZ uh, just inside of the boundary of the xylem, and then protons in the middle, and those protons repel each other. And you know, repulsive forces are really strong. We we mostly don't realize how strong they are, but they can be extremely uh, strong if you have enough positive charges. And so, basically, if you build up these positive charges in the core of the xylem, they're they're, they're so they're protons stuck to water molecules, and they're going to go up because they can't go down, uh, um, or the obstacles going down. And, and so I, I think this is the, the essence of the mechanism that that drives water uh, in the xylem and, and also in phloem and, and uh, other systems. You know, um, the movement of water is is so common um, in, in us uh, throughout your cell. Water needs to move from one place to another, even outside the cell. And, uh, and these mechanisms are not understood at all. I, I, I do think that there's a good chance that the mechanism I'm talking about applies. And remember, in springtime, uh, the sap begins to flow. In the springtime uh, is when you're getting infrared energy. Infrared energy builds easy water, which builds uh, protons and the hydronium ions. So, so, and the flow is beginning in the springtime, uh, in, in essence. And so there's a time correlation between the two that lends credence to the idea that it's the infrared energy from outside um, that's uh, uh, mediating the uh, growth of EZ. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, the protons, which are responsible for creating pressure that that uh, moves uh, moves the water up. Uh, and by the way, <laughs> I, I'm sorry if this is a deviation, but um, I like it. Um, Do you ever think about spring water? Yes. And and this is this goes even further. If you go to Mount Lemmon in Arizona, yeah, you go through seven or six or seven different um, ecosystems, starting with the desert floor. Um, then you get into sage. Um, then you get into these crazy cactuses that have the arms straight up. Yeah. Then you get into uh, more deciduous shrubs. Then you get into deciduous trees, and at the top you have conifers. Well, there's water bubbling up out of the top of that mountain, right? So common thought would be, oh, it's just the pressure of the, you know, the plates or, or soil around the base of the mountain that's squirting it up. But that doesn't make any sense. No, it, it doesn't. But uh, And if it did make sense, uh, then you'd have to say, well, well, what's driving those plates? Where's the energy? <laughs> you know, and um, um, so uh, and and. In in, um, in the Himalayas, you know, highest places on the surface of the earth, um, someone reported that there was something like four thousand springs, and the water always likes to flow downhill. Right. So how does the water get all the way up there? You know, it's it's fine. It could be some of that water is really good to drink, uh, but how does the water get up there? And I, I think it's it's the same phenomenon that I've been discussing. It's. Uh, it, it has to do um, has to do with the creation of EZ water, and whenever you create EZ water, you create protons, hydronium ions, and in, a, in an enclosed space, pressure builds, and the pressure pushes on every surface, and it pushes up, as well as in every other direction. So you can get spring water, and um, it's not only spring water, but you know if you ask a question about uh, volcanoes, so. So I live in the state of Washington, and we all remember Mount St. Helens and when it blew, and it it lost uh, like a, a third of the height of its original height or a quarter of its original height. The mountain just blew, and so you have to ask a question: Where does the energy come from? You can imagine how much energy is required to blow up a mountain. Um, it's a lot of lot of energy, and uh, a possibility um, uh, is that. Is that this energy actually comes from uh, water that's beneath the surface? So, if if there are hydrophilic hydrophilic uh, surfaces in some of the rocks and, and minerals that are there, uh, uh, that will build EZ and will build uh, protons and hydronium ions beyond. 
and if the space is somewhat confined, the pressure will build up. And uh, uh, the, the pressure could build up tremendously if there are no outlets for the pressure. And when the pressure builds up enough, uh, it could blow off the top of the mountain. So I think uh, uh, that's a, a possibility. I, I must admit, I, <laughs> I just finished the first draft of a book that deals with volcanoes and earthquakes. And I think that water and easy water is centrally involved. So agreed 100%. And we know um, that the force of steam is incredibly powerful. And so you're adding heat to the power of the easy water on these hydrophilic cracks in between all the rocks. Yep. You're, at, it's, you're creating the forces of, you know, incredible amounts of Absolutely. Potentially, potentially nuclear power. Um, I mean, to blow the top of a mountain off is no joke, and you're right. I mean, it lost at least a quarter, if not a third of it. Well, I don't, I don't remember the exact number, but I, I do. It's the kind of thing like uh, uh, people remember when they heard the news that Kennedy was shot, and and in, in in the state of Washington, people people remember where they were when Mount St. Helens blew, even though we knew it was coming. Uh, but but still, when finally it was a Sunday morning, and I remember. I was at my son's, uh, my other son's uh, school performance, and and suddenly, uh, someone said the mountain blew, and um, and so, you know, it was it was an experience that is unforgettable when you think of a mountain blowing up. So yeah, so water water is water is so critical for everything and everyone and for plants for animals and and even beyond that, as I was just just. Um, um, uh, discussing uh, uh, some of the geophysical phenomena uh, that that we know of, but we don't understand them. Uh, water and easy water may be the central pillar holding up those that edifice or those edifices. Yeah, and and just to reel back for a second, I uh, have traveled from California up to Washington uh, all the way to Bellingham a couple of times. And I love there's this one gas station that you could pull over off of the freeway and you look directly across the freeway at Mount St. Helens. Oh. And I asked the guy, I said, were, were you around when, when you know, she popped her top? And he was like, no, thank God, because it must have been one hell of a sight from here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, I think there were some people who, who, um, you know, daredevils who didn't want to leave. And I think about 50 people were killed, even yeah. though we had a, like a month's warning that this is going to happen. But some people decided to remain there. And, you know, it, and the heat in, in, in some places that were like 10 or 15 miles away was enough to melt some, some metals that had a, a high melting temperature. Uh, so, so the the temperature must have risen to uh, enormous levels in the region near the volcano. Uh, yeah, there's some amazing footage. Yeah, uh, that was taken, and I've seen the clips. There's about three different views of it, but just the force that that did that is is mind bending to say the least. Yeah, that, and the force it, it is, it leads me to to another. Uh, issue. I, I've been thinking also about um, things that are really fundamental, not only um, uh, to everything, to including including plants and agriculture. And so the, let me just deviate for a moment. That it has to do, it has to do with the structure of the atom. And I've I've completed a book on what I'm going to uh, tell you. And as soon as my son gets to finish the illustrations, it'll it'll be published. And I. Um, in this book, I deal with the structure of the atom. And we all know um, uh, from 100 years ago, roughly, Niels Bohr from Denmark uh, came up with a so-called so solar system model with a nucleus and electrons mm -hmm. that run around it. And that model exists today, though modified by quantum mechanical considerations. But the essence remains the same. We still have a nucleus with protons uh, and neutrons. And we have orbitals with electrons that are, or electron clouds that are, that are running around it. And, um, and in the book, I, um, I, I present reasons why that model is completely inadequate. It, it's a, even a non-starter. And I, I apologize for what seems like arrogance, but 
but it has to do with the repulsive charges to, to, and attractive charges to start with. So think about the nucleus. It's got, uh, it's got uh, protons and neutrons. And neutrons are neutral, uh, but protons are positively charged. And when you put positive charges near one another, what do they want to do? They want to get away from one another. And when you pack them really tightly, as in the nucleus, uh, supposedly, um, they want to, uh, they have a tremendous urge. Uh, the nucleus should basically explode. You mentioned nuclear explosion. This is a nucleus or nuclear explosion that should happen. The physicists actually recognized this problem and um, they came up with a solution to the problem, but it's not really a solution. It's called the strong force. So uh, somebody said, there must be a force that holds it all together, otherwise it would explode. And we know, quote unquote, that the model must be right. Therefore, there must be this kind of glue, this kind of force that holds it together, but affects nothing else. And that's what's called the strong force. The problem is there's no evidence, uh, no independent evidence for the existence of a strong force. It was just deduced that it's got to be there because we know, quote unquote, that the model is right and therefore, if it's right, the nucleus can explode. So, so we invent this so-called strong force, which has now become one of the, the four basic um, uh, forces of nature. But it's beyond, beyond that. Think about it. You've got a, a nucleus sitting here with positive charge, and the electrons around it have negative charge. As we discussed before, and every middle school student knows, plus and minus attract. So, what prevents the electrons um, from collapsing onto the nucleus and therefore taking the, the atom and, and, and turning it into a point, a, a nothing that doesn't take up any space? This is, a, this is based on a you know, fundamental understanding of electrostatics. Uh, now, if you, if, you, if you say that electrostatics don't apply, you know, then you're inventing something uh, new. You're, you, you can say that when you get down to the atomic level, yeah, the charges are meaningless. But if that's true, then, and you know that charges do matter at the molecular level, all the biochemistry is based on that, uh, then where's the boundary between when they don't matter and when they do matter? It becomes really ambiguous. And so, so the electrostatics are a real problem. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and ju just building on that problem, suppose uh, an electron comes, a new electron, um, and uh, it, it's coming to, to hit an atom, right? It has to know whether those orbitals, distinct orbitals, whether they're full or not full, because the first orbital, uh, by decree, has two electrons. The next one is eight and so on. And so the electron has got to know whether, whether an orbital is full or not full. How does it know? And, and since the electrons are negatively charged and the new electron coming in is negatively charged, what it really wants to do is avoid those orbitals and sit in between uh, two orbitals, if anything. Uh, but it doesn't do that according to the theory. So I'm just giving you a capsule of, of um, very simple uh, objections to, uh, to that theory. Yeah. And as I said, the book is finished. I'm waiting for my son to... Um, 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 to have time to finish the drawings. And, and um, the book doesn't just end on that negative tone. It, it, it builds, um, it, it suggests a, a, a replacement model um, that can, do, doesn't have any of these instability uh, problems. And I argue that it explains natural phenomena in a way much simpler than, than the old model. So I'm, I'm really excited about that, and um, I'm hopeful that the book will come out probably within one year from now. And, um, and it's a real serious problem. It's a problem for all of nature, all of science, uh, in, including including your science, um, you know, of agriculture and plants and such. So it's exciting. And just one last point on this: that you know, there's there's a common misperception that that the model that came out 100 years ago by Bohr was immediately accepted by everybody, and it wasn't. Um, the chemists especially, um, one, one quote from one of the most famous chemists uh, was, um, 
this doesn't this model doesn't explain even the simplest of chemical reactions <laughs> so it can't possibly be right and uh, another prominent uh, chemist thought the same thing and even came up with a a, a model for the atom wh which is a, a cubic model um, and and so is the model that that i'm suggesting and i found this only after i had drafted the book i found that uh, this uh, uh, G.N. Lewis was the guy's name, and he was a very prominent chemist a uh, hundred years ago, uh, famous for Lewis bases and Lewis acids, and um, uh, he was one of a handful of really prominent chemists. But but the chemists had their heyday uh, in the century prior, and and uh, the twentieth century was the century of physics. Physics. So so the physicists were the ones who were dominating, and this was a model that came from physics and was anointed by many of the physicists who built on that and built quantum mechanics on that uh, as well. And so it's stuck. And now it's in every textbook and it's been there for five generations. And so we we assume that that uh, it must be correct if it's been in the textbook for five generations. On the other hand, any middle school student can tell you why it can't be right. So I, 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 I guess let me, <laughs> let me end my speech there. And I know you've got uh, other questions no no i i'm loving where you're going it was, this was my hope i i kind of came about it the wrong way originally i was like well, what's new because i kind of knew <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but on that note it's like the understanding of that these forces of positive and negative should collapse um the 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 force behind even the electrons, they should explode out. I mean, what is holding these things together? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought about that, uh, right, because one electron shell, it, it sees another electron shell and the two repel. So yeah, it should, it should. The whole thing should just explode. It, yeah, it, the whole thing should explode. Thank you for another argument. I hadn't thought about that one. <laughs> also, you know, you want to put two atoms together, right, because, um, and my, my my computer here is made of aluminum, I think. Uh, uh, and you take two aluminum atoms. In order to get a solid, you got to put a whole bunch of atoms together. And they, they need to stick to one another, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and and on the periodic table, uh, something like 90% of, uh, of the entries in the table, the room temperature are solids. So it means, in general, atoms really need to stick to one another. But here's the problem. Uh, you've got an atom here, uh, the nucleus, and you've got negative charges all around it. And next atom, you've got negative charges all around it. And so you, wanna, you want these two to stick to one another, and, and you try to bring them together in some way, or they try to come together in some way, and you've got negative facing negative. All they want to do is repel. They don't want to stick. Um, there, there's uh, an expedient that's used to say, well, they share electrons. Uh, uh, if somehow that that is even if that's true, you still have the same problem. How do they stick to one another? Um, you know, there there may be a, a mathematical artifice that allows you to imagine how they might stick, but it doesn't make sense. And then then you've got spaces because if if an atom is a sphere, another atom is a sphere. Right. There's space that you can't. You can. They will meet at one point, and then. Uh, around that point, you've got one space here, one space there. What's in that space? Is you got it, lots of space. Yeah, lots. lots of space, undefined, right? Yep. The space. So uh, there are all these problems, um, and as far as I've been able to see, these problems are not discussed, uh, it be, and simply because because the model's been around for for so long, um, and and therefore, you know, because things are have gotten so complicated with. The advent of quantum mechanics most people maybe myself included most people say oh we'll just leave it to those smart physicists i can't understand the thing that they're talking about but they're smart and they've got it all figured out so we <laughs> delegate responsibility to those physicists and those physicists in order to um, have uh, successful careers they have to toe the line um, they 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 need to to work in an area that is sort of believed by everybody. Otherwise, they won't survive in their careers. So so the system is, I hate to use the term rigged because that's become a, a popular political term, but in, in a sense, the system, the scientific system, the way of doing science 
it's is, is simply not conducive to the success of revolutionary ideas. I hundred percent agree. Okay. And, and this leads right into uh, another understanding that really doesn't make sense. And that is when we start dealing with these complex human created compounds, i.e. pesticides, um, there's this interesting phenomenon called biogeochemical reactions and interactions. And we've determined for sure uh, that certain biology will begin to starts by degrading these compounds and breaking them into smaller compounds, which then are degraded even more and continue to break down until they're basically decomposed back to their original element yeah. and therefore safe. They're no longer toxic or poisonous. And it all goes back to that electron sharing and donating and it, and it just rolls right into this like all right that doesn't add up one plus one doesn't equal eight and <laughs> so what are we missing here i mean we we've, we've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt in certain environments for instance the muncher it's another uh company that i've been working with consulting to help them understand what they've actually done um they have uh created this environment that basically acts like a primordial soup or an amniotic fluid um, but it lets it allows cell division to occur on a on a level that's just unheard of in other words you put in five gallons five gallon bucket full of food waste one hour later it's gone it's it's been suspended uh, it's been chopped up into uh, tiny tiny little particulate smaller than even silt um, yes, some silt does precipitate out of it during the process, but when we introduced um, a very poisonous concoction of roots uh, from berries that were planted, again, you have to understand that, that monocropping um, only encourages nature to come in and destroy it, especially when you hop these plants up on NPK. So they're forced to use tremendous amounts of insecticides and fungicides. Um, so the, obviously the ball, the root ball and the stalks that the, the berry plant itself, um, has been bathed in this stuff multiple times over the course of the two to three year lifespan. That's, that, that's all they last. They, they've cooked in these things so hard that, that after two to three years, they're, they they can't produce anymore. Unlike nature will produce forever. Right? So typically this company would be required uh, to have this, these canes, as they're called, which is again root balls and stalks, um, they have to pay to to get rid of it uh, a, a, a tremendous amount of money. And, and to be honest with you, it's not enough for the disposal that they're giving it. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. It's just poisoning something else, right? Bottom line, it, the poison has not been broken down. It's just going somewhere else where someone willing to take it. And so we ran a whole bunch of those through uh, the muncher. And at the end, we tested the output. We did an entire uh, pesticide panel. I think there was, I don't know, 80 or 90 different compounds that were uh, measured to see if they were present. And we knew of the eight that should have been present, that, that are always building up in these canes. And they were non-detect after this process. So we know for sure that biology and in the right uh, communities can, you know, break these extremely complex compounds down back to a, a non-hazardous uh, form. So again, it goes back to what you were saying, the, 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 the mechanics, the, the math, uh, the, un, our understanding of it. Um, doesn't make any sense. And, you know, the only thing that was missing from um, the mathematical equation was life, right? Is, is the biology, is, is the life, the introduction of life into these situations. And this goes right back to water in the cell, right? The water in those cells. I mean, 
you probably know, I forget, it's some kind of crazy astronomical number, the number of water molecules inside a single cell bacteria. Do, do you, off the hand, do you know? I, 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 I don't know, but I, I can there are 33 or 333 billion water molecules per cell. Thank you. Okay. It's, it's astronomical. I mean, uh, it, it, the, just the fact that they're all fit in there. The cells should explode. Well, the molecule is pretty small. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but so is the cell. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, by by atomic standards, the cell is is a, a, a like the size of a planet. Uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're probably right. But remember, there's also a tremendous amount of um, how do I say this? Other components, oregano's. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there are. But you know that the the one number that I thought originally were searching for is that uh, you know most people know we're roughly seventy percent water by volume, uh, and and it it varies. Uh, for newborns, it's uh, maybe ninety percent, and for people my age, it may be down to sixty percent or even less. That's why you see wrinkles here, dried out, um, but. If you do, if you consider instead of by volume, if you do a molecular count, uh, if you line up all the molecules in the cell and start counting one by one, it turns out that more than 99 out of 100 uh, are water molecules. And it's because the water molecule is so small to fill that two thirds, roughly, or 70% volume, you need a lot of water molecules to fill, fill that bin. Um, and what's surprising uh, is that is that modern biology um, considers the water molecules basically uh, useless. All they do is bathe the more important molecules of life. And this, is, this is the viewpoint in pretty much every cell biology or biochemistry book. Uh, the book opens, chapter one talks about water, inevitably, and then the word water never appears again through the rest of the book. It's, it's though, they're telling you that water is there. It's just basically a solvent, and everything else depends on DNA and proteins and uh, what what have you. So, um, it seems to me it it uh, borders uh, on somewhere between uh, arrogant and 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 um, uh, unrealistic. Uh, you got ninety nine percent of the molecules in your body don't do anything. They do everything. Or, or is it all about? easy water and the positive negative electrical charge of the battery in the cell that's actually powering what's happening in the cell uh well maybe you should be replacing me on this interview <laughs> <laughs> you, have all, you have it all worked out <laughs> so <laughs> well I'm gonna, I'm gonna poke a hole in that because uh, <laughs> because the other piece that we're not talking about um with easy water it has excluded everything but H2O. So um, where are the minerals? Where are the nutrients? Where are these components that <clears throat> are flowing up the, the plant uh, in, the, in the form of minerals and nutrients? Well, um, so some have found experimentally that they're sticking to the organelles uh, is, is where they are. Um, they're not in, in the, so uh, the water inside the cell there there are many pieces of evidence that argue for this is mostly easy water um mm -hmm. and and easy water we mentioned is negatively charged and that's why the cell is negatively charged and uh, of course that flies in the face of what almost everybody believes uh, which is that the negative charge of the cell um is a product of the pumps and channels in the membrane um and i've presented um, a whole bunch of arguments to say that that's not true. It can't, it can't be true. Um, I, I can go over some of them if you, if you want, but a simpler argument is that if the cell is filled with easy water, it's going to have a negative charge because easy water has a negative charge. That's simple, simple interpretation. You know, you, you take a bag and you put negative charges in and, and the bag in, in interstices will have negative charge. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And um, I've also argued that for anything that the cell does, um, the cell needs that negative charge, needs that easy water, uh, which bears the negative charge. Because when the cell is activated, and this is 
um, spelled out in great detail in my earlier book, Sales, Gels, and the Engines of Life, uh, the sale undergoes a phase transition. And the phase transition is well known among physical chemists it's that biologists don't, don't think that way. So you start with uh, uh, easy water or structured water, or fourth phase water, or whatever, negative charge um, in, in, in the um, unactivated state. And when the cell moves from unactivated to activated, like a muscle cell would be from relaxed to contracting, a nerve cell would be from not conducting to conducting, a secretory cell would be doing nothing and secreting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what happens is that the cell undergoes a phase transition. And what the phase transition means is essentially that this ordered water, structured water, fourth phase water, undergoes a change back to um, this kind of water, right? And 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 if it turns into this kind of water, the proteins also will undergo some kind of conformational change together with the change in water, because the water and the proteins are in, interacting, and that's what achieves the action of the cell. If it's a muscle cell, that's what achieves a contraction. That the water has changed uh, from the easy water to ordinary liquid water. And that facilitates the proteins undergoing some change, which which cre creates the contraction. And then when it's over, you got to go back again. And that that's the critical um, energy requiring step to get back to the building the structure because building structure requires energy. Um, and so if there's not enough energy around. Like we take a muscle cell, your muscle cell may wind up cramped. It always will wind up contracted in some way because the relaxation. Uh, the return to the original state requires energy. If there's not enough energy, um, then you, you can't return and you get a knot in your muscle and it has to be worked out by putting additional energy in and eventually it gets worked out. So uh, uh, so it's the, the change in, in water and you were talking about various in, in, uh, ingredients and contaminants and whatever. When the cell, when the cell is in uh, the easy state, uh, easy water, it's like ice. It's not ice, but but it, it essentially has some of the same features or properties of ice. Things can't diffuse around. Uh, nothing happens. Uh, the cell is basically not doing anything. And then when it when it undergoes the transition uh, from that state to ordinary water, and and the proteins are contracting, then it has every uh, every bit of ability to communicate with the outside, and so. So uh, um, entities that are harmful to the cell can get expelled that way and do get expelled. And other necessary ingredients can come into the cell. You see, that's where all the exchange takes place during that transition state when the action is occurring. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm not sure if that, if that responds to your, your question, but you started by talking about uh, the various contaminants uh, uh, getting broken down and leaving the cell. And, and what I just um, tried to, to explain may be some way of addressing that issue. So another piece that's always uh, made me question um, a lot of the information is, well, we know we have cations and anions, the nutrient value, um, and they, are, they too are positive and negatively charged. So if the cell um, was in the non-contracted, the relaxed phase, easy, um, then it would make sense that it could pull in cations or or allow cations to enter and store on the oregano. Um, but as soon as that cell transfers or contracts, then automatically those are going to be expelled out of the cell. Well, uh, the, the second part, yes, they, they can go out. But the first part, there's not much that can happen when, when the cell, when the water is in the easy state because you can't have diffusion. Uh, all the molecules are linked to other other molecules. It doesn't allow substances to move around. And so, so I'm I, I'm I'm not sure. Um, um, certainly, you could you could test this with dyes, for example. You take a, a, a you take a, an EZ that forms, it doesn't matter how it forms, uh, it could form next to a gel or next to a polymeric substance. And then you put dye, you, you pass it, put some dye into the surrounding solution. It will never enter. 
it won't come in no matter what dye you use if if it doesn't impact the structure itself the dye will never enter and we tried many dyes and the dyes stay in the region beyond the ez the region where those protons are but it never enters and this is one way of one way of denoting the ez because various dyes don't enter so if i extrapolate from the behavior of the dyes all the way to the cell um i i would would think that uh, that any any exposure uh, of the cell to uh, to various entities they won't be able to enter um uh, and but but during the transition phase when it's undergone a, a phase change and the water becomes liquid water then they can enter freely down their diffusion gradient so so that's a maybe a slightly different way of looking at what what might happen um but i think all all of these need to be studied in in detail agreed 100 percent. and you know again not to beat the dead horse but the way um, Dr. Lane Ingham explains it and others, um, is that the cell itself has what it's called a pantry in it, where it stores different compounds it needs to um, expand, or what do you say, contract or repel or deal with, say, a pH change or, or deal with a horizontal gene transfer of some kind. So wouldn't it make sense, though, that that pantry would have both uh, negative and positive charges, so it wouldn't matter whether the cell was relaxed in 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 an easy uh, water phase. Yeah. Or if they're comp compartmentalized, uh, absolutely. You know, so they could be held in some organelle um, that would be um, um, uh, maybe surrounded by easy water, but might or might not have easy water inside. Yeah, yeah that's certainly possible. A vesicle of some sort, sure. Yeah, but well, I, I think that, again, that needs to be explored. I, I haven't seen it explored. There, there's not very much that's been explored um, in, in, uh, under the framework that I've been talking about uh, where the cell is filled with easy water. Um, and, and, and therefore, you know, interpretations are going to be uh, uh, entirely different if you think about the cell as having an impermeable membrane except for pumps and channels and liquid water inside versus having easy water inside uh, in the absence of pumps or, or channels. You know, if you if you take <laughs> one simple argument uh, um, of, of many against the idea of pumps and channels, you know, the cytoplasm is a, is a gel. Um, that's been established for like 60 or 70 years. There's a famous book by a guy named Fry Wusling uh, a prominent biologist uh, that, that made a, a real impact. It was at the time, I think, of World War II. And he, and, and the, even the title of the book is The Gel-Like Nature of the Cytoplasm. And you, you, could, actually, you could actually test this yourself. Um, you can, if you're brave enough, you can take a razor blade and put out your forearm and uh, run it along your forearm. Um, and if the cell is filled with liquid water rather than a gel-like water which is easy water viscous water um, when you cut yourself the water should come pouring out of those cells just like pouring out of a water pipe that's been breached uh, you maybe you've seen that uh, it, it shoots out um, and, and it doesn't you know even even I, i've got a, a few surgeon friends and they tell me that they can cut deeply in the abdomen and they'll slice right through a muscle and no water comes out so so it's not liquid water it's it, it, it's actually a gel gel like water so it turns out um I'm trying to complete the circle of argument that i've been trying to uh develop that if you take a gel um uh, a gel made of water and some negatively charged framework which is very typical of of gels um uh, and you stick an electrode in and uh, into the gel and and uh uh, reference electrode outside, you get negative potential of like 100, 150 millivolts, just like the cell, but it has no membrane and therefore no pumps, no channels, just the gel, just the basically the inside of the cell. So if the inside of the cell gives you the same negative potential as the full cell, it's really hard to argue logically that it, for the full cell that the negative comes from the membrane. 
and the membrane uh, pumps and, and channels. So that's only one of a half dozen different different arguments against the existence um, of uh, of this membrane gadgetry. So um, I'm, I'm not sure what led to uh, my discourse on this, but it was a question or an argument that you brought forth. But, yeah, no, no. Again, I'm poking the bear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, think, I think we went wrong. Um, you know, it, it, it was early on, it made a lot of sense. Um, the first thing that arose was a, a pump, the sodium pump. And um, the idea was, uh, well, how come there's so much sodium outside, but so little inside the cell? And someone came up with the idea there must be a pump in the membrane. Um, and, and, um, and that was challenged by the same Gilbert Ling, I, who I was describing earlier and he did experiments and he showed that the amount of energy that was required just to do to pump the sodium out was something like 30 times what the cell could possibly muster uh, and um, and then since then uh, there have been perhaps more than a thousand pump a thousand pumps that have ha have been uh, suggested by various researchers and if you think about the amount of energy, the cell simply doesn't have it, can't do it. Um, so if the cell can't muster the energy, if those calculations are you know, reasonable, it, it's impossible. And the same thing with channels. Uh, so you know, there's supposed to be ion selective channels in the membrane. And that made good sense early on because uh, you know, certain ions could get in, certain ions couldn't get in. And, and so the idea of selective channels exists. And, uh, it, it, those uh, of your listeners who, who know the field a little bit will, will know that if you take a piece of membrane and take a patch clamp and put a potential difference, uh, you get currents that look like a spike, uh, another spike, and another spike, and so on. And those spikes are thought, spikes of current. They're thought to be uh, correspond to the openings of the channel, open, close, open, close, and you get spike, 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 and so on. However, uh, there are no fewer than four or five experiments that showed that if you if you take artificial membranes with no channels, no pumps, you get the same result. It's hard to, you know, I mean, given this evidence, it's uh, it's it's really hard to to take seriously the idea of channels and pumps, and and that's only those are uh, I only mentioned a couple of the of, of the issues. It's in every textbook. All the pharmaceutical companies are basing basing their uh, their drugs on oh, this is a calcium channel blocker, or et cetera, et cetera. They feel obliged to to um, to to explain the efficacy of their products in terms of channels and pumps. But if channels and pumps don't exist, then perhaps they need to look elsewhere. Uh, the evidence convinces me that they don't exist and there's a simpler way, much simpler way of understanding the electrical potential of the cell. And that is the negative charge of the easy water that fills the cell. And then when, when the cell decides that it wants to contract, where is it pulling the energy from? Is it pulling infrared energy. energy. Um, so infrared energy builds the easy water um and um you know you can't you can't get energy from nothing it has to be another kind of energy um that is converted into energy so your question is a good one uh, is is well put um where does the cell get its energy so um, uh, um the infrared energy is necessary for building easy water and and for separating charge of easy water and then protons and, and so the cell um, it's filled with easy water because infrared energy um, has has been delivered to build, and it's always around, to build the easy water inside the cell. So that amounts to, you know, what we say is potential energy. And, and those negative charges inside the cell, they want desperately to get away from one another. And, and so uh, the zero potential energy would be a situation where all those negative charges have dissipated and they're a mile away from one another. That's no energy. But when they're packed together and they repel, just like we were talking about the protons repelling, when um, if they repel, um, that's 
uh, potential energy, and that energy gets used to drive the contraction. Now, um, uh, you and and your listeners uh, uh, will probably know that um, the textbook view is that energy comes from the um, ATP, from the from the splitting of the high energy phosphate bond in the ATP. And so, what I'm telling you seems to be contrary to that. Now, it may be supplementary to that or as as ling has argued um the the uh, atp idea is not all that firm as 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 we think it is he points out in in um on his website which has just disappeared so i i'm not sure i can find the reference but i've <coughs> excuse me i've i've visited uh quite a few times and um he points out you know, it was like uh, 80 years ago or something like this that a prominent chemistry group uh, reported that ATP has a, uh, it's got three phosphates and one of those phosphates have a, has a high energy bond. And the energy from that bond could be released uh, to deliver energy to the cell. And it, it's become dogma that that is the case. What people don't know uh, is that shortly after that first paper was published, another physical chemistry uh, group equally prominent said these first guys they made a mistake a simple arithmetic error there is no such thing as a high energy phosphate bond they screwed up and as ling points out um nobody has followed up since then so we don't know whether whether the original uh, 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 uh the original group that described the energy, the high energy phosphate bond is correct, or whether the challengers are correct. Nobody's followed up. And 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 therefore, there's some uncertainty uh, about ATP uh, and, and, and its ability to supply energy. So if it turns out, if it turns out that the original group is confirmed, then it would look like there are two energy sources. One is uh, ATP. Um, and, and the other one is this electrical energy that I've been talking about. Uh, if it turns out that it's not confirmed, uh, then there's a backup, and it is the electrical energy that I'm talking about, which, which could supply energy. You know, we now have some concrete examples of where it does. It could supply energy to the cell. So energetics are, are not, not so clear right now. Need Desperately need follow-up studies. Yes, in all of this. Um, yeah. You know, and, and this isn't the first time I've heard um, ATP being questioned as uh, this mechanism for. Well, if you if you know if you know the evidence, please send me later because I'm not able to to access Ling's website, and I really would like to see uh, and read that that paper. So, if you know of of papers that challenge it, um, please take the trouble to send them to me. All right, I will I will put my feelers out. I've seen a few short art articles that. Not so much questioned the high energy phosphate as much as they um, questioned the ability for ATP to be the energy currency for all of them. Ah, uh, I see. Um, so, yeah. you know, basically it was understood that this is how, you know, everything from photosynthesis gets into exudates, gets into the movement up and down. You know, it's supplying, it's the currency. So if I want a pizza, I need my ATP. Yeah. card to get my pizza or if i want a bottle of water i need that card to get the bottle of water so um i think that it, it probably leans back toward exactly what he was stating is that there possibly isn't this this high energy uh phosphate but i i you know it was again it was not a full on white paper it was more an article um discussing the questions behind um atp as this all 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 in energy source or currency amongst the uh, plant functions yeah I'll, I'll chase it it's so important uh, it, it, because essentially anything the cell does regards energy and if you if you don't know where the energy is coming from uh the mechanisms that you uh, describe are going to be ambiguous and and really difficult to to um, put together so very important uh, this particular issue but you know we 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 have projected a backup in case atp the atp story doesn't it turns out to not hold this electrical energy we don't think of the body as being electrical but 
but everybody's familiar with, uh, you know, electrocardiogram, uh, electroencephalogram, and and various uh, uh, action potentials in cells and electrical phenomena are actually, you know, very very common. It's just that they may be more common than we think, even more pervasive. I think if uh, if Ness, N Nikolai Tesla was not destroyed as a human, we'd probably know a lot more. I agree. Yeah, he was. Um, yeah, he was amazing in so many so many ways. Yeah. So many ways. Um, yeah. And and it goes like, you know, we all know about kinetic energy, right? And and so we know the cells are are have millivolts, and technically, you know, we should be able to throw lightning bolts out of our fingertips. But the problem with that would be that you would discharge like a like a, a capacitor everything at once and that would probably kill you if you did it because <laughs> you've expelled all of the energy that you use to support your life but again you know it's it, one plus one is supposed to add to two <laughs> and when it comes to energy it doesn't it just doesn't <laughs> add up. so again uh you know really wonderful to have this conversation with you today normally at this point i i hold back and we go to questions but i just wanted to see if there was anything else that you'd like to add um to some of the other things that you have been working on that we haven't gotten to. uh well um yeah i'm i'm not sure if this is too far out for your uh listeners but um we we began uh studying um one of the several things we're studying now about the role of healers in uh, uh, producing uh, uh, a kind of energy that that can can heal, um, uh, and um, so uh, many of the healers feel uh, w the ones who are successful. And I know quite a few who actually um, uh, re remarkably can can do this. Where they, they claim that that they're they're channeling some kind of energy from from in the environment they don't understand it but it goes through them and then to the patient and it has a positive effect on on the patient and so we we began studying it and so we invite healers um, who are known to be successful to the laboratory and we have a vial of water and a control that's uh, somewhere outside um, and we have them uh, put their energy into the water uh, in any way that they're accustomed to doing and then we we uh, measure the properties of the water before and after and to see whether there's a difference whether they've had some impact on the water because the idea is that the water the water may um, uh, have some kind of information storing uh, capability and we've just begun those studies but um it, in one aspect of the studies there's a a, a guy who uh, uh, who has the ability to cure cancer and um i i won't say his name here because uh, our our results are only preliminary but our preliminary results show um, that there's an effect there's an impact on the water so that that is one area that uh, where we we've we've gotten into um uh, uh we're we're also um um have have been studying actually uh, the xylem of plants uh, uh, to see if there's if there's uh, flow and uh, if the flow is impacted by infrared energy and so far results are positive on that one too but you know instead of instead of ending with those sort of you might say new new results we don't have too many new results because our our lab is limited because as i mentioned earlier um, to hire people to do do the experiments, you need funding, and we've had a devil of a time because um, it's hard for us to get funding through the normal mechanisms, the normal funding agencies, because because uh, the the ideas are too radical, and uh, for the reviewers even to to review it, they need to understand um, about easy water and such, and most most are too busy to pay attention uh, to it. So so we've had a string of bad luck. Um, um, increasingly uh, lately, and so we're depending on people with deep pockets who who um, who want to donate to something uh, that's 
the real truth seeking in science and um uh, anyway that the, so we don't have uh we don't have so much that's that's going on uh at the moment uh, the lab activities are diminished somewhat but we're hopeful that this will will change in the uh, in in the near future but i guess if there's one if there's one theme i'd like to end on um it's it's about about revolutionary science and um I can only stress the importance of it. So, if you if you think about it from like a practical point of view, um, the one area that is interest of interest to you, of course, is agriculture. And maybe you're aware or not aware that, for example, there are reports that that playing music uh, to the plants has a positive uh, positive impact. And that's you know, way out of traditional thinking. It's, you might say, revolutionary thinking, but but there's quite a bit of evidence uh, now. Um, you know, I, I organize each year um, the annual conference on, on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water. And inevitably, there'll be two or three people who uh, will make a presentation uh, on on agriculture and, 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 and water. And there are various kinds of energies that are, uh, uh, that, are distinctly helpful, and easy water is also helpful. So um, people who who uh, water their plants uh, with wa with easy water report uh, better growth than if they use standard ir irrigation. And one of the reasons that rainwater, for example, is preferred over irrigation water is that we found that the droplets of rain contain the easy shells. So they're getting the plants are getting easy water and just like humans um, the plants are operating the same way if they get easy um, their cells need to be filled with easy and so if they re can recruit some of the easy from outside like from uh, the rain um, that it's going to improve their uh, well well-being so you know plants animals um, the principles may be very similar in in the two cases but uh i i, I deviated a little what i i guess what i what I want to say is that the revolutionary science is so incredibly important um, and in solving the problems of the day, not just agricultural, producing food for myriad people who um, don't, don't have enough food, but all the problems that exist today, which keep increasing from year to year, even month to month, we need, you know, some of these problems can be solved by political means if, if we have the stomach to do it. Um, but but others can be uh, addressed with scientific uh, uh, kinds of, uh, of approaches, like, for example, getting electricity, getting enough electricity. So in our, our fourth phase water, as I mentioned earlier, we showed proof of principle. You stick one electrode in the negative and one in the positive, and, and the current that you get is enough to light an LED lamp. This can be scaled up, and uh, we, we don't, we don't know if it's practical or not practical, but nobody's tried yet. If it could be scaled up, it could possibly solve one of the multiple problems of the world is getting enough energy. This is just water, basically water and light. Uh, no well, need. In many ways, uh, water is a battery. Uh, water is a battery. Uh, no doubt. The water is a battery. And, uh, and, uh, and so, so, you this, know, and yeah. there's another thing that I wanted to tell you about. Have you heard about electroculture? Electroculture? Yeah. So where you basically take a wooden stick, you wrap it with copper wires, and you put some antennas on the top of it. You plant it in the soil in your planter bed, and then you run a copper wire down the middle of the bed, and the plants just explode. So it's, I'm, I'm thinking that there may be a tie-in to what you're talking about feeding easy water to plants, Maybe that is structuring the physical water in trapped in the soil itself. Well, it could well be uh, because we found also that if you pass uh, negative charge, negative current into water, it transitions to easy water. Um, we published that, um, and so if somehow that circuit that you're talking about is able to um, to inject electrons. Uh, uh, which wires do often inject electrons into it that would be consistent with what what we've found earlier and um, uh, it, by the way if you could if you have a paper handy that describes that I would love to to see oh, it. I'll, 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 I'll 
thing you on that stuff. Uh, it's well, no, I don't say too much because my life is crazy. But, <laughs> uh, I promise yeah, I, I won't bury you. I, I, get, I get so many, uh, you know, hey, I've got this great idea. Here's a 50 page manuscript. Tell me what you think. And, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I know. It's, yeah it's, that's, that's I, I, I just can't. I can't do it. Is my so, and another phenomenon is you, you brought up energy healers. So Pauline, uh, my beloved, uh, was a, was a energy healer. She did many different things, uh, uh, but one of the things that was the most incredible, I, I've been to a lot of, um, uh, Reiki masters in my life. Um, I've had serious injuries. Um, I'm, I'm not a big guy for pharmaceuticals. Um, and but the power that she could create when she cupped her hands together, um, I had a back injury. Um, I, I tried the pharmaceutical route; it just didn't work for me. You know, I knew it wouldn't, but I, I you know, you, yeah, you yeah, yeah, I hear you. Right? So after a few days of that, I, I went to her healing center. At this time, I didn't know her. Um, we had, we had met once before, um, but I the the owner of the um, the facility or the, the clinic was like, all right, I'll put you uh, with Pauline for Reiki and um, restorative yoga and stretching to start pulling those uh, muscles apart. And I'll give you Jampa for uh, Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And when she first did the, the first session of Reiki, I thought my back was on fire. Like it literally hurt like she put a hot pan on my back and so you know wow. yeah so i know there are people that can channel it, whether they are masters born that way or whether they've you know really done the hard work i mean the real hard work to to learn to channeling these things um but again that energy that she was putting into me she must have been harvesting from outside of herself but in many ways, that could have been also uh, a way to transfer um, ultraviolet or, or perhaps negative energy that was affecting um, the cell structure around uh, my spine where I had the dissectomy. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so that was just a, a kind of a point that I wanted to say, like, if you do know of any Reiki masters, it might be really interesting to see how they affect the water. Well, yeah. That, thank you for that that suggestion. Yeah, it, it has been something of a challenge to to find uh, the competent uh, healers or Reiki masters. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, if they're local, it's easier. Uh, if they're not local, it's more difficult. Uh, yeah, and but you're in you're in Washington, who's very open minded. I mean, if you you go back east, they call you, you know, a witch for doing this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Did they burn you at the stake? Or? Yeah, in southern part, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it gets pretty ugly really quick. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's, the I don't know, the conservative uh, mindset of, of you know, the blue bloods is, is often rejects a lot of these things. Like you said, I mean, as soon as you go outside the box, um, you get resistance, which is, you know, is hard. Um, I mean, I went through resistance for 15 years when I started telling people, Hey, no, there's life in the soil. It's not dead. There's this whole other ecosystem that supports the ecosystem that supports us. But, you know, again, it's, it's hard selling new ideas and new concepts that go against the dogma of humanity. Yeah. You have to find people who are open-minded who are open to it. And, um, uh, uh, it's been my experience that uh, once once uh, uh, someone cracks open the eggs, so, so to speak, and uh, uh, is exposed to one uh, phenomenon that is sort of non-mainstream, they they find themselves open to many. Uh, yes. uh, it's what I found. So cracking the egg is the hard part. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like you know, like breatharians who who don't eat. So everybody knows that. You'll die if you don't eat or you drink, or but it's not true because there are hundreds of thousands I found out of people who don't eat for periods of time ranging from a few weeks or a month to indefinitely. Um, I, I've met some of those people, and um, uh, there's a, a, a video by uh, uh, an Austrian filmmaker who who uh, 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 interviews some two dozen people who do that all the time. And how do you? 
how do you explain it? You know, there's got to be, you got to get energy from somewhere. And, um, and the question is, where? So it's up, up to us scientists, you know, there's a tendency for science today to reject anything that is not already understood. Uh, because the assumption is, well, we know virtually everything there is to know about science. And if something comes up, if it doesn't fit into the paradigm or paradigms that we understand, it must be it must be fake. It must be wrong. It must be AI um, um, generated or, or something like this. Instead of saying this is pretty interesting, you know, and uh, it's been shown by a half dozen different people. Therefore, it looks as though it might be true, and therefore, it's up to us to study it and understand what's going on. That's what scientists do for a living. And but scientists are not doing that for a living today. No, uh, they mostly remain in their conservative mode. Uh, um, uh, it feels comfortable. I, you know, got to admit that if you if you've learned something in school and you've thought about it and even taught it, uh, um, you begin to believe it must be absolutely true. If someone challenges it, you feel not so good about that challenge. That uh, the challenger must be a crackpot of some sort. And that, that view holds practical consequences, too, because it means that if you try, try to get uh, money for research, it's a lot easier. Uh, if the people who are reviewing your application are people who share your vision. Um, agreed, agreed 100 percent. So all right, well, let's, let's bounce to questions. I don't know if we'll be able to get to them all, um, but. Um, OK, let's we'll start with Casper's uh, uh, one here. Uh, is this some of the stuff Schoenberger was close to understanding? This is from earlier in the show. Yeah, Schauberger. I, uh, Schauberger. Yeah, Schauberger. Yeah, Victor Schauberger um, has made a, a real impact um, uh, on, uh, on science. And yeah, I think it is. Um, uh, the problem with Schauberger uh, is, is that he, was a, he wasn't a scientist, he was a naturalist. And his writings are... Uh, virtually uninterpretable by scientists today, and so there has been a, um, there have been some books that were written based uh, to ex to expose Schauberger's ideas, and and some of them actually make a lot of sense and had some impact on on myself uh, also. So, for example, Schauberger talks about living water versus dead water. He says living water is water that's been moving around, uh, and and dead water is water that's been stagnant. And um, so I'd, I'd like to think uh, um, uh, that what we found, the easy water, which contains energy, is, is equivalent to Schauberger's living water. Uh, that's one aspect. Another aspect is, is the fish. Um, so Schauberger was talking about trout that he saw in the stream uh, because he was a naturalist working in the forest. And he watched the trout, and um, he said um, that the, that the stream is 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 going obviously downhill, and the trout is is oriented uphill, and the trout can actually maintain itself despite the fact that the water is running down the hill uh, beside the fish. How does the fish do that? And he said he observed this numerous times, and if a predator showed up, then. Uh, you'd think that the fish would run downstream because it's easier, but actually the trout runs upstream. Uh, hmm. uh, so in my uh, forthcoming book, uh, the one that's coming out first, I talk about the uh, swimming of fish. And I think I have an answer to that uh, question. And, and the more, 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 generally, more generally, what's the mechanism of fish swimming? Uh, you know, if you, if you read on Wikipedia or wherever you want to read, They'll tell you there are two things. One is the flapping of the tail, um, and the second is undulations in the body. Well, I've studied muscles and muscle contraction for uh, uh, two or three decades, and I can't understand how undulations of the body would would push the fish forward in any meaningful way. I can't understand how flapping of the tail can do that because I had a sailboat, and if there was no wind, you just stick the oar out of the back and go back and forth. But the speed that you can attain uh, forward speed by moving the oar back and forth is trivial, um, it, it barely. But you can see fish like in an aquarium. You can watch a dolphin or something like that, um, or uh, just take off at some high speed. You know, and and uh, how does it do that? And 
if you if you watch, I I watched actually the dolphins uh, very carefully because I am curious about how how fish swim, and you can see the dolphin uh, just before it, it took off at high speed, it flapped its tail a couple of times, and then it no longer flapped and it accelerated. But we know from Newton that in order to accelerate, you need to have a force that exists at that time, not beforehand. And mm -hmm. but so it doesn't fit it doesn't it doesn't work and so the two mechanisms that you find in the textbook don't are, are not adequate to explain how creatures work their way through the water and in the book i describe what i i, I think is going on which i think makes more sense but um maybe i should stop here and, um, well you know one little caveat is the um black marlin can yeah. travel to 82 miles an hour. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it it must be because the fish is hydrophilic, you've got that, you know, the easy zone around it in the, in the biomass or the slime or the biofilm, whatever you want to call it. But, wow. and, and you, when they're, when they're swimming at that speed, their tail's not doing this. Right. It's Absolutely. doing this. And so yeah. how, how is that transferred? Well, I mean, I answer that in the book. And I think it has, cool. to, do, it has to do with electrical charges uh, that um, are, are surrounding the fish and the taper of the fish's body. But, uh, you know, it, I, I, I don't want to go into an elaborate explanation there because I, uh, there, is a lot, there are a lot of points to raise. But, uh, but, but basically... Um, <laughs> You know, you 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 go on to tempt me. That's that's one of the issues. So the 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 water, you know, fish takes in water take in water through their mouth, right? And that water gets expelled through the gill slits. You know, those curved slits on the side, um, and and those slits are filled with protons or hydronium ions. There's evidence for that. Um, so the fish takes in takes in the water and. And, and does the same thing that I've been talking about. It divides it into negative and positive. And the negative is used by the fish uh, for energy. And the positive comes out those gill slits. But if you've got a lot of positive charges um, and they're pressing against the body, the rear body, and the body is tapered, it's going to push the fish forward. And, and the power of those charges is much, much larger than most of us imagine. Uh, I, I, I show some... Um, uh, demonstrations of how powerful that can be. So I think I think that uh, the propulsion uh, of fish have has something to do with charges, and I I detail that in 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 one of the chapters. I also have a lot of fun, you know, sailboats. Uh, I don't know if you guys sail, but oh, oh yeah. you do, yeah. So so you know that um, you know going downwind is easy to explain, but but going upwind is is a, a bit more difficult. And I, when I came to the University of Washington uh, the first year, I took some lessons in sailing. It was offered free to university faculty members uh, or new university faculty members. I could, I just couldn't get how sails, how sailboat could go into the wind. Well, it doesn't go directly into the wind. Uh, probably your sailboat and the old clunker I had could, could, could no, go no closer than 45 degrees off the wind. But I, I learned that racing boats. Can go 30 degrees off the wind and ice boats uh that is like a sailboat running on ice with almost no friction can go practically dead into the wind now when you think about that it's it's like i'm pushing you and you're moving toward me <laughs> mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah so something is wrong uh, yep yep uh, and, and and the idea that fish are basically rail guns <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, sorry, what are uh, basically rail guns? Oh, rail guns. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't uh, wait for the new book to come out. Okay, hold on, guys. I, I got to get to this this next question because it's. I think it's it's something journal is going to be interested in. Yeah. I tap trees and separate the sap from the water. I distilled that water and didn't lose any of that water to distillation process. Any thoughts on this? He, the water just got thicker. Well, thicker, um, um, uh, thicker means uh, uh, that 
I would interpret as thicker, meaning that liquid water is turning into easy water uh, because easy water is viscous and, um, you know, you might call it thicker, but the viscous would be uh, the scientific term. So I, I, I'm not sure of the details of your, your questioner, but when I hear thicker, I, I think of conversion into easy water. I'm not sure if that's the right answer, but I, I'm sorry. I, uh, I, I need to know more details. Uh, you know. Uh, he chops trees for their sap. That's what he's using it in his nutrient um, for feeding his plants. So yeah. he's been uh, taking it down, uh, boiling it like he would maple syrup. Um, so he's distillation. now drying. Yeah, he's distillate. Distillation. Yeah. So he's using another form of energy. Yeah. To separate the water from any contaminants. So yeah. it would make sense that he's making easy water. Well, he's getting rid of all the contaminants. Um, quite, quite possibly. And, uh, um, you know, the, the heat is supplying infrared energy. So that would also go along with, with what you're, you're suggesting. Um, uh, so maybe so, maybe you got the right answer. Uh, um, <laughs> He's experimenting. We're all experimenting, Gerald, and we love it. <laughs> I do have one question. I'd like, um, have you tested for the uh, effective or uh, the wavelength you're using for the infrared light uh, in nanometers? Do you know if you increase or decrease uh, the level at the nanometer scale if there's an increase or decrease in easy water? Well, that's exactly what we did. Um, um, so we set up an exclusion zone in, in the way we usually do next to a hydrophilic surface and it excludes the microspheres. Um, and, and, uh, and then we expose it to light of different wavelengths. And we actually started, started at the, um, uh, at the very short wavelength, uh, range of, um, ultraviolet. And we found UV has, has no effect actually more recently in the paper just accepted today for publication. One of the other studies that's going on, we found that although you don't get an increase in easy, you get an increase in easy charge with ultraviolet, which Wait. I think is, is important. Yeah. And then you go on to the longer wavelengths, you, you get to the violets and to the, the, uh, visible uh, range and we saw no effect at all as we, we got to the reds you know around 700 750 nanometers uh wavelength we began to see a little bit of increase and as we went beyond that to eight nine hundred a thousand we got an appreciable increase and and going into the infrared the biggest increase was at uh three thousand nanometers and if you if you know that 3,000 nanometers is the wavelength that water absorbs the most. And, and it produced, we found that 3,000 nanometers uh, is, is the water that builds EZ uh, the most. It was by a spectacular amount. Uh, we could easily increase EZ size by a factor of 10 times by applying really weak light at three micrometers or 3,000 uh, nanometers. And we tried some longer wavelengths as much as we could get commercial LEDs and we found appreciable increase but but you know infrared extends uh, to much longer wavelengths and we we haven't been able to study those um, we haven't been able to get sources that are appropriate for those those wavelengths so we we know that the most effective wavelength uh, is is the wavelength that water absorbs the most and so you know if you think about it it means that what water is doing is absorbing infrared tremendously and turning that infrared into uh, easy water. It, it makes lovely sense, I think. I agree. Yeah. Fair. We have time for one more. Or? Oh, yeah, I have one more is fine. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll call it. <clears throat> uh, so like a one-way Newton cradle kind of thing. I don't know what a new, uh, Newton cradle is. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, neither do I. So that was gone. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is actually something that my wife came up with. Uh, Barbara Ann Brenner. She was a NASA scientist uh, turned healer, uh, physiotherapist. Uh, so that might be someone that you want to check into. She wrote uh, a couple of different books. Um, Hands of Light, a guide to healing through the human energy uh, field. 
but uh, she's uh, put a lot of effort into this on the scientific side as she was a NASA scientist. Nice. So uh, I'm not sure what the question is. No, it wasn't a question. She was just sharing. Oh, sharing okay. I'm sure. Thank you. If, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. that you, if you reached out to her, maybe she would be willing to come in and um, do some work with you to, to, mod, to, to try to understand what this pulling energy out of the atmosphere is all about. Well, no, I mean, she she might. And as far as I've been able to see so far, nobody has any any idea uh, of the nature of this energy. You know, it's a little bit akin to our understanding of electromagnetic energy. Uh, 300 years ago, if someone talked about electromagnetic energy, it would sound like woo woo. Yeah, what, what, what are you talking about? You know, uh, uh, un until some of the pioneers uh, came around. Uh, and uh, described what, what is this electromagnetic energy. And now everybody knows it, but a few hundred years ago, it would have been the same perhaps as the energy we're talking about now, which is undefined. Nobody understands it. And uh, it seems to be able to travel from one end of the earth to the other as, as easily as a, a meter away. Mm -hmm. In um, a split second or a nanosecond. It's it's yeah. like it's right. like the it's like the Higgins boson, the Mullins, and some of these other subatomic particles that are what comes from the degradation of electrons and photons. Sure, and sure, so yeah. It's, it's, so, it's yeah. yeah. Uh, we need we need electrons. Electrons really really help us, and it, it's really too bad that Benjamin Franklin uh, didn't reverse his his description. Uh, his mm -hmm. uh, negative charges should have been positive because, <laughs> you know, and positive charges should be negative because that way, that way everything would make sense. Because to be positive, to to be positive in our health, we need negative charges. <laughs> and it's it's the same in pH. pH is ass backwards. You know, pH EH is the measurement of protons and pH is the measurement of electrons. If it was EH for electrons and pH for, for photons, it would have been a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody's interested, please read our paper um, um, on, on, on pH. I, I mean, it goes along your, your lines. Uh, and um, I, I had asked people who came to my office, uh, the, the same question asked to numerous people, if you have low pH, does that mean you have an excess of protons? If you have high pH, does that mean you have an excess of OH minus? Or is it always neutral? Now, I don't know how you guys would answer, but 50% of the people roughly said, gave one answer and 50% gave the other answer, which convinced me that nobody knows the right answer. You know? <laughs> so, so, for example, <laughs> you know, if, if, I, if I suggested that, well, if you have low pH, um, uh, you have an excess protons, but but how does that how does that work? Because if you put HCl in the water, H is plus one and the Cl is minus one, and that gives you neutral, and and yet it has low pH, right? So they couldn't answer that one. It didn't didn't make any sense. Anyway, we did a series of experiments, and we showed, in indeed, um, that if you um, if you have low pH, you have excess positive charges, and if you have uh, high pH, you have excess negative charges, negative charges. So it really is a measure uh, in, in simple terms. It's a measure of the, the, the uh, concentration of either positive or negative charges that you have, what you're really measuring. And the term pH just confuses the matter. It makes something more complicated that is actually really simple. Uh, so um, it's a uh, 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 Tao Yi is uh, Y E is is a author and myself. If anybody has interest in in that, uh, I I like that paper because it's so simplifying. You know, well, people are asking where we can find it. Can you uh, forward it? Can you forward it to Ken so he can put it up? Uh, sure. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. I'll do that. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Well, and you're you're going to forward a couple of things to me also. Okay. Yes, yes, I will for sure. And okay. and I um I, I do want to be respectful of your time here. You you've been on for two hours and four minutes and really appreciate you, sir, uh, for all the work that you do in this cutting edge science that is so desperately needed in this world. Um there there's so much that we should have as human right, as a as a right. We were born on this planet, yet 
we don't have access to clean water, free energy, and clean food. And and you are the one of the people that is groundbreaking and, and bringing this type of knowledge forth that we could uh, potentially get away from the bondage that we're in. So again, uh, deep, thank deep, you deep, so much. I, I, I really appreciate that comment. Uh, that's very nice of you. No, okay. Good. Anyway, uh, take care, and I All will right. send this stuff. Okay. Ciao. Thank okay. you. We'll, we'll have you back on again soon. Thank okay. you, Mike. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see.